Before its collapse in 1991, the Soviet Union, composed of 15 constituent Soviet Socialist Republics, was the largest country in the world. At its territorial peak, the Soviet Union covered nearly one-sixth of the Earth's land surface. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation, formerly one of the Soviet Union's 15 constituent republics, became the largest country in the world. In this video, we'll consider the implications of the Russian Federation's geographic, economic, and social complexities. How is Russia's enormous territory arranged and governed? How diverse are its constituent regions? And why, despite being formally called the Russian Federation, is Russia still considered a unitary state? Like in Canada, Russia's population is distributed unevenly across its territory as a result of large swaths of inhospitable land. Of Russia's 146 million residents, 110 million, over 70 percent, live west of the Ural Mountains that divide the country between Europe and Asia. The country's rich natural resource reserves, which include oil, gas, and metals, are predominantly located in those regions with inauspicious climates. This includes many regions of Siberia, such as the oil and gas-rich Tiumen region and the diamond-rich Republic of Sakha. While ethnic Russians make up about 80% of the population, Russia is also home to a diverse range of ethnic and national groups. In order to govern this vast and diverse territory, the Russian Federation is divided into 85 administrative regions. 22 of these administrative regions are referred to as republics. Of these republics, 21 are considered ethnic republics, which in most cases are named after the titular ethnic groups that inhabit them. The 22nd, the Republic of Crimea, is an occupied territory that was annexed from Ukraine into the Russian Federation in 2014. Although the international community does not recognize Crimea as Russian, Russia's constitution currently treats it as a federal subject and governs it accordingly. Although Russian is the official language at the national level, the Russian constitution grants Russia's ethnic republics the right to recognize local non-Russian languages as official languages within their constitutions. The North Caucasus, a region along the northern slope of the Caucasus mountain range, provides a glimpse into the scope of diversity across Russia's regions. The North Caucasus is a small population of around 10 million, which is also Russia's youngest population with the highest birth rates. It is very distinct compared to other Russian regions, representing an intricate system of dozens of strong ethnic cultures, each with their own vernaculars, uh, idea of historical homeland, customary laws, rituals, and religious awareness. The most ethnically homogeneous republics are Chechnya and Ingushetia. The most diverse region is Dagestan, with over 30 distinct ethnic groups. Five of the national republics in the North Caucasus are predominantly Muslim. North Ossetia is predominant, predominantly Orthodox Christian. Conversion to these religions occurred at different times, and both Orthodox and Muslim practices are deeply interwoven with the ethnic traditions. North Caucasus economy was crushed by the collapse of the Soviet Union and the ensuing violent conflict. All the national republics are heavily dependent on central state funding. The levels of unemployment are the highest in Russia, while quality of life is the lowest. Public services like education, healthcare, housing are of poor quality due to large-scale corruption, outflow of highly qualified cadres from the region and bad quality of governance, the result of lack of democratic accountability of elites and lack of political competition. In the recent years, armed conflict has lessened significantly, but Chechnya has become a totalitarian enclave within the increasingly authoritarian Russian Federation while the other republics still suffer from lingering political conflicts and chronic problems with the quality of governance. The Chechen factor plays a prominent role in shaping Russian domestic politics, and the North Caucasus republics continue to supply significant numbers of foreign fighters to the areas of armed conflict outside the Russian borders, including Syria, Iraq and Ukraine. A look at regional differences between gross domestic products per capita can help to illustrate the huge economic disparities between Russia's wealthiest regions and its poorest regions. In 2018, the highest grossing Russian federal subject, the oil and gas producing Nenets Autonomous Okrug, 
had a GDP per capita nearly 62 times higher than the lowest grossing federal subject, the Republic of Ingushetia. These economic disparities don't only manifest themselves across regions, they are also visible in Russia's urban-rural divide. While Russia is an urbanized country, about half of the population still lives in rural areas or small to medium-sized towns where living conditions aren't too different from in rural areas. Often, economic disparities can be even more striking between an urban center and a nearby village than between different regions located thousands of kilometers apart. Russia is undergoing a strong internal migration directed westward. The vast territories in Siberia and the Far East are progressively losing their populations as citizens are moving to European Russia in search of better infrastructure and job opportunities. As a result, Russia's population is growing increasingly concentrated in just a few territories, particularly Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Krasnodar Krai, all located in European Russia. The diversity across Russia's regions has important implications for Russia's system of governance today. Russia is the biggest country in the world by its territory and the biggest federation, at least formally, uh, according to number of regions. Uh, it's too big uh, to be governed uh, from one and the same center in democratic way. That's why there is explanation that the fact that Russia almost all time in its history looked as authoritarian state is strongly connected to its huge size. The federal reform of the year 2000, immediately when Putin came to power, took place, aimed at dismantling those elements of federalism which did appear in the 90s. And the essence of this federal and, in fact, anti-federal reform was establishing of seven federal districts uh, with plenipotentiary invoice of the president sent to each of them, weakening uh, of governors uh, as uh, political players, late even bilateral treaties between the center and regions were broken, and in the year 2004, uh, direct gubernatorial elections were uh, abolished. Not only defederalization took place uh, by political means, it was going on uh, due to financial reasons because the center uh, did concentrate and did increase essentially its share of revenues. The center is giving money and that's why the center controls uh, regions. In the 90s, there was huge regional diversity uh, in political design. Now it's absolutely the same. There is almost total control over regional elite. The center appoints, in fact, appoints governors. Sometimes uh, they've never been to the region where they've been appointed. And now, during the uh, constitutional reform of 2020, the center uh, took out of regions even remaining certain elements of uh, their powers. Conclusion is that Russia is no more a federal country although there is huge regional diversity. This means, uh, in my view, uh, that sooner or later, Russia, if only Russia does have prospects as democratic state, should restore elements of federalism, not uh, only due to the fact that it can hardly be effectively managed from Moscow, from one and the same center, but due to the fact that this regional diversity, which still is huge, should somehow uh, shape the way how regions are managed, the way how their political and managerial design look.